Imagine this. You are in an Africa safari vehicle. Suddenly, a breathtaking moment unfolds before your eyes. Dramatic light, once a lifetime encounter, but in a rush to capture it, you fumble with your camera settings and just like that, the shot slips away. A missed opportunity for greatness, for connection with your viewers. And to add salt to the wound, someone else right beside you effortlessly captured the scene you only dreamt of capturing and you saw that big grin on their face. Has that happened to you? Because it certainly did for me. So I went on this mission to crack the code of camera settings for difficult situations, such as subjects popping in and out of shadows, bright background, dark background, and those leaving you scratching your head to determine what is the right exposure compensation. Which camera mode is the best? Aperture priority promises depth of view, but there is a major problem on shutter speed that can ruin the sharpness. Shutter priority? Yeah, it's great for action shots, but wait until you hear my disastrous stories. How about manual with auto ISO, the golden standard nowadays? Well, there is also one major flaw I'm gonna share with you in a bit. But in the midst of all this confusion, there is a way of hope. There is a simple trick hiding in plain sight that will change the game for you. It all comes down to knowing the name of this one little cable. Can you say the name of this cable? Once you understand what I mean, you'll be snapping those elusive shots like a pro. So stick around, cause by the end of this video, you'll be the one smiling instead, armed with the secrets to taking your photography to the next level. There are lots of videos about the concept of metering by some good photographers. I have the links below and I'm not gonna repeat here. Instead, I'm going to share a few deadly failures that had happened to me. But first, why is perfect metering so important? Let's not forget the essence of photography. It's not just about snapping pictures to document moments. It's about creating art, a transfer of emotion from the photographer to the viewer. And in this art form, light is our paintbrush. The more dramatic the light, the deeper the emotion it invokes. Understanding metering becomes paramount, especially in dramatic and tricky situations like pre-dawn, sunrise, sunset, rain, snowstorm, or fast changing light and background. Picture this, late January in the heart of Yellowstone National Park. The knee-deep snow chills you to the bone. We are on the trail of a bobcat, its elegant form weaving through the snow like a ghost. As she paused at the edge of the rock, poised to leap. I can hardly contain my excitement. That is it. The shot of a lifetime. The bobcat frozen in midair against a backdrop of pristine wilderness. For some reason, I listened to my friend who told me to try aperture priority that day. Somehow I thought it kind of makes sense. Why not give it a try? So I glanced at the bottom of my viewfinder. I was at f 5.6, 2000 of a second, which is enough to freeze any of the jumping action, and ISO is at 800, which is decent. The bobcat jumped really high. I blasted 10 shots, and I'm sure I got the shots. That evening at the hotel room, sitting in front of my computer, I opened the file. I almost fainted. All of them were blurred. My roommate, Dono, was smiling. That is not possible, Tin Man. The bobcat was definitely being locked in focus, and no way, 2000 of a second, I couldn't freeze the motion. But why are all the photos blurry? Wait, why the shutter speed reads 200 of a second instead of 2000 of a second? Turned out during the jump, the sun moved behind some clouds, and it got a lot darker. And because of the aperture priority mode, Aperture remains at 5.6, ISO remains at 800, but shutter speed dropped from 2000 of a second to 200 of a second without me knowing. Because after the jump, the sun comes back up and the shutter speed was back to 2000 of a second. And I missed all the shots. My heart still bleeds thinking about the moment, even after so many years. Yes, you can set minimum shutter speed in camera, but let me tell you what happened next. Determined not to repeat the same mistake, I switched tactics in my next Patagonia trip. 
We were tracking the elusive mountain lion there. After hiking for hours, I was drenched in sweat like I just climbed out of a swimming pool. I saw the mountain lion at the edge of a cliff, resting against this beautiful, deep blue, distant mountain. I couldn't believe my luck. Again. This time, it was late evening, and the surrounding looked kind of dark. I checked the settings. I was at f2.8, 2000 of a second, ISO 1600, and this time I'm at shutter priority. I managed to get a few shots before the mountain lion disappeared. Later that day, in the hotel room, I checked the files in my computer. And my heart sunk into the abyss, yet again. The photos this time were not blurry, they were sharp. However, there were two stops underexposed. And the reason was that ISO is fixed at 1600 and the shutter speed at 2000 of a second. The aperture couldn't open more than 2.8. So with a lack of light, the photo became underexposed. The photo became so noisy after I increased the brightness in post-processing and all the details were lost. In these relatively low light moments, we often find ourselves sacrificing either the aperture, shutter speed, or ISO to capture the essence of the scene. Think of it this way. When you are flush with cash, you might not blink an eye at the price tag of a Starbucks Grande Americano, which I love. But when your wallet's feeling the pinch, every sense matters. Similarly in photography, ample light in mid-afternoon may afford us the luxury of overlooking minor exposure adjustments. But you wouldn't really care about the crappy pictures you get from those lights, would you? However, in low light, underexposure coupled with high ISO results in noisy subpar images. While noise reduction software has advanced, mastering photography goes beyond relying solely in post-processing fixes. Now let's dive into the heart of the matter. Picture waking up in the middle of the night, searching for the bathroom with every ounce of available light through the window so that my toes don't kick on the corner of the table. In low light situations, our aim is to maximize sensors exposure to light, wide open aperture to let in the most light with slowest possible shutter speed to maintain sharpness while maintaining an ISO that's not in the 10,000 to 20,000 range. We intentionally overexpose the scene to minimize noise, which is the concept of ETTR, exposed to the right. Not gonna talk about it in details, but the idea behind it is that if we can push the histogram to the right, we get much more details in the image during low light situation. Have you looked directly into the sun at noon? Ah, your eyes will be blinded for a few minutes. Too much exposure, the image sensor will also go blind, putting pure white patches in those areas, losing all the details, which is called blown out highlight or blinkies. You can't recover those areas in post-processing. And these overexposed areas not only distract from the overall image, but can also lead to rejection in photography contests or publications, based on my experience being the judge of Nature Photographer of the Year and other contests, seeing what triggers the judges the most. It's a fine line going for the optimal overexposure while making sure there are no blinkies. And that's why watching the highlight is critical. And that's what the H stands for in this cable. But what about the D, M, and I? I'll explain. So you may ask why I didn't use auto ISO. Well, back then it would not be possible because the technology was not there yet. It wouldn't allow me to change the exposure compensation on the fly. I actually had to click open the menu and go into a few pages to change it every time. But thank God, a few years later, they finally introduced that feature into cameras such as Canon 7D Mark II and Canon 1DX Mark II. And with mirrorless camera, it's even easier because you can see the effect in the viewfinder immediately. So I thought all metering challenge was forever resolved from then on. The only challenge remains at how to set the exposure compensation once auto ISO is chosen. When we use evaluative metering or matrix metering, the default setting is a little bit underexposed. So I always set my 
exposure compensation EV at plus 0.7. It has served me well. And when I'm doing backlit against darker background, say in early morning, I usually switch to minus two. So all I need to remember is just these two settings and life was good. So this one morning at minus 15 degrees Celsius, again in Patagonia, photographing the mountain lion this time, the situation was perfect. The ambient light in the morning turned the sky into a golden glow and a puma family were walking. We positioned ourselves so that the mountain lion seems to be walking towards our direction with the orange backdrop behind them. I have all the proper setting this time. I took a test shot. Looks perfect. As the mountain lion got closer, I continued to take the shot. Yes, the most epic shots I've ever taken this time, I guess. When I got back to the hotel, my heart was broken again. The first photo I got had this nice, beautiful orange color, but the pose of the animal is not perfect and the surrounding have some tall grass. Then the next few photos when everything were perfect, somehow we were all overexposed with blown out sky. I don't know why, because it's the same scene, but somehow with auto ISO, the settings kept jumping and nine out of the 10 photos were overexposed and I lost all the colors in the background. That is non-recoverable. Auto ISO used to work really well for digital SLRs such as my Nikon D850, but for mirrorless camera, even when the amount of light is relatively stable and that the scene is kind of the same, the ISO somehow would be super sensitive and it would jump from 1600 to 8000 in my case. So I just can't use auto ISO in this kind of situation. And indeed, with auto ISO enabled, I rely too much on the camera setting everything for me and I forgot to check what ISO exactly I was on. For example, an hour before sunset, I may be shooting at 2000 of a second at ISO 1600. But as it gets darker, the ISO may have shot up to 20,000 and I would have easily dialed the shutter speed down to 500 of a second so that the ISO would also come down to about 5,000, which would still provide usable image with low noise, even if I have to sacrifice some of the shots to have motion blur, but I'm sure that some of the shots will still be sharp. Gambling is worth it during those times. Full manual mode with manual ISO allows me to be on top of my settings at all time. It's like driving a car and knowing full well which gear I am in. So when you exit a turn, you know exactly how to accelerate the quickest by putting yourself in the right gear. So is doing manual difficult? But the key thing is to turn on the histogram. Even better, if I use Sony camera like this, they actually have an option called a zebra. It will just tell me which part of the image has blown out highlights and will be blinking with some zebra kind of pattern on it. I have the link below for a video that teaches you how to set up the zebra in your Sony camera if you are using one. With the histogram or the zebra turned on, it's like playing a game of whack-a-mole. Once I set the aperture, shutter speed, and ISO, I just check to see if there are any blinkies. And if not, I just turn the photo brighter and brighter by changing just two things. Number one, the ISO, and number two, the shutter speed. And once I see any zebra showing, I know that I'm just a bit over the limit of exposure. And I just tone it down by either dialing up the shutter speed if the ISO is not too high, or I keep the same shutter speed and dial down the ISO. But how do I know what to begin with? Well, funny thing is, every morning the sun comes up from the horizon with similar amount of light. And before the sun comes up, when the sky is still kind of golden, I usually start with 200 of a second f2.8 and ISO 5000. I'll be gambling on getting a few sharp photos only that don't have a lot of noise. When more light is coming in, I will start to see the zebra showing up in my Sony camera. Or from the histogram in Nikon and Canon, I will see that there will be some clipping on the right hand side of the histogram. And all I need is just to dial up the shutter speed to ensure more shots will be sharp. And once the shutter speed is at an optimal, for example, like 1600 of a second for animals, and then I'll dial down the ISO to reduce noise. Some may say it's better to have high ISO always so that the shutter speed can stay high as well to ensure sharpness. 
But what's the fun of it if you play it so safe instead of pursuing mastery? I like to live dangerously for perfection. So in the field, my index finger is always on the shutter speed and my thumb is on the ISO dial. And then based on the brightest part of the histogram, the highlight, I'll keep on adjusting the ISO dial. So this method called highlight driven metering by ISO dialing is saving my life. So after I adopted this method, finally I got the shots I've dreamed about. The golden background with minimum noise, such as this African wild dog photo in early morning, and also this bear photo. And nailing a shot with a dark subject in a dark background becomes easy. All I need is just to make sure I don't have any blinkies. So for example, this one I've taken in Yellowstone National Park. I saw this raven in the cold morning, breathing out. So I wait for that moment and I took this shot. Shot at f5.6, at 2000 of a second, at ISO 800. No more ISO jumping around in auto ISO because I'm in full manual mode. One morning, two lion brothers were in and out of shadow. When it's in the shadow, I simply don't take any photos because it won't be any drama in it and it wouldn't evoke emotion. Photography is not doing an assignment or homework where I have to nail every single opportunity, even if the photo is crappy. I'm done with doing homework after I graduated from schools. Once the first light was shining on these two lions, I was able to dial down the ISO so that there is no blown out highlights and I got this shot. Now that you know how to find the best metering, the next step is to make sure to bring out the best from your raw file. So check out this video where I talk about the most deadly mistakes in post-processing. Remember to subscribe, comment below what you think, and I'll see you guys next time.